Hello and welcome to GameSec. This time we are talking about HD remasters. We are, and you know, Joe, I've always been skeptical about these things. I've always felt that they've just been a cheap attempt to cash in on the franchise again, so... Let's see. I yeah, mean, I don't know. I mean, we review a bunch of them, so let's take a look and see if that's the case. Devil May Cry had three games available for the PlayStation 2. The first one started out built around a Resident Evil formula in many ways. But when the action began, it was fast and frenetic. You had your sword, guns, as well as some other sweet ass moves. You were graded on how rad your attacks were. I never really latched onto that particular aspect, but it's still pretty fun to get high grades. Devil May Cry 2 came next. This one is pretty much more of the same, but the areas all seemed much bigger. It still retains the camera angle switching as you move around in each scene, and that will mess you up especially when going through doorways. The fighting feels slightly more refined, and personally I do feel that this game improves on the first one. This one comes on two discs, a Dante disc and a Lucia disc. Why they didn't just put it on a dual layer DVD is beyond me, especially since many of the assets are repeated on both discs. But hey, what the hell do I know? Anyway, as you can imagine, each disc lets you play through each character's story. Lucia is kind of fun to play, as her attacks are slightly different. Then came Devil May Cry 3, which was the third game if you can believe that. This time, a touch more control is allowed over the camera in certain scenes. And this game is where I feel the series started to flourish. It's definitely a bit tougher, but once everything clicks, you'll be okay. All of these games ran in 480i only on the PS2, and there were no widescreen options. But at least they ran at 60 fields per second, and in case you didn't know, a field is a half resolution frame. Without getting too much into how television standards at the time worked, it's basically a huge compromise to get high resolution out of a broadcast signal, but each field can be a different moment in time. Anyway, in 2012, Capcom released the Devil May Cry HD Collection, and this disc has Devil May Cry 1, 2, and 3. It's available for the PS3 and Xbox 360, and I'm playing it on the PS3 here. As you can see, the games look much, much better. Everything is now presented in 720p. The texture quality also feels improved and the lighting is much better. Everything's not so dark. I feel that the PS2 as a console had really, really dark graphics. And it's now in widescreen as well. And it truly is wider, it's not just cropped to fit or something like that. And as you'd expect, it all runs at 60 fully realized frames per second. However, it must be noted that some of the cutscenes and menus are still in 4x3. This is because they did not re-render the cutscenes or redraw the menus. Some cutscenes, like the third game's opening here, do in fact take up the entire width of the screen, but it looks pretty low quality. The non-FMV cutscenes, which are done via the game engine, of course, look much sharper and there's nothing to complain about there. I'm really not sure why the menu screens weren't redrawn, as honestly, that doesn't seem like a monumental task. Oh well, to me this is a minor gripe and I play video games for the gameplay, not the menus in the cutscenes. And the gameplay is still awesome. As far as I can tell, they didn't make any changes to the games themselves other than the visual overhaul. The audio got a slight upgrade to 7.1 surround sound. According to the box, it will also do Dolby Digital and DTS over the optical cable, which is 5.1 surround. There are some surround sound effects here and there, but it's nothing amazing. In fact, there's no discrete subwoofer effects at all. Maybe the Xbox 360 version has some, because I've noticed that Xbox 360 games are often a lot better about their subwoofer than PS3 games are. So it's great that all three games are on here. Part 2 lets you choose to play as Dante or Lucia when selecting the game. Part 3 is the Dante's Awakening Special Edition version, so that's cool. Everything is all on one disc and it looks and sounds great. I don't know how they got the Xbox 360 version all on one disc, as that console used the same ancient DVD technology as the PS2 did. I have to assume that some compromises were probably made. But here's my main gripe about this collection. There's no way to exit the game and go back to the menu and play a different one. You need to go all the way back to the PS3 menu and reboot the game, then choose a different one to play. Still, besides that, this is a great collection to have. It's fairly cheap, so look into it unless you'd rather play the dark, jaggy looking PS2 versions. God of War Origins Collection was released in 2011 for the PS3. Included are the two games that were released on the PSP, Chains of Olympus and Ghost of Sparta. 
Both of these games and the Origins Collection was developed by Ready at Dawn and not Santa Monica Studios like the other games. Ready at Dawn is a good developer comprised of people from Blizzard and Naughty Dog. I really had a great time playing these titles on the PSP and honestly this was the first HD collection disc that I bought. God of War is one of those series that just attracted me right from the beginning. I love the ancient Greek setting and actually enjoy the storylines. The hack and slash gameplay never gets old and thankfully it's never really changed throughout all the installments. Even though the games were originally in widescreen on the PSP, the handheld only has a resolution of 480 by 272 which isn't much more than the 8 and 16 bit systems. I was really curious to see how these games would look in HD. Well the proof is in the video that you're watching. The remaster really made a huge difference for the visuals which is no surprise since they're now running in 1080p which is about 4 times the resolution of the originals. Everything looks cleaner and much brighter. In the PSP games there's areas where I was almost getting lost because of how dark it was. I was even playing the game on a bigger screen via the component video out option. The game also flows a lot smoother now thanks to the higher frame rate. There's a lot of jagged lines on almost everything in the PSP versions and those are all cleaned up and it looks really good. The games are even playable in 3D but I haven't tried it out since I don't own a 3D TV but I'm interested in seeing it. There's a few extras that have been included on the bonus disc but of course they're locked right from the beginning. If you beat the game you unlock a video shot from somebody's iPhone 4 judging by the quality of it. It shows employees at Ready at Dawn Studios pretending like they enjoy working. I'm not fooled though because there's no way that they could be having fun. Other things can be unlocked like videos of lost levels and the making of the Attica level but you have to beat challenges and also beat the game on God mode. I'm not about to do either of these so they'll stay locked probably forever. There's other unlockables like costumes and I don't care for that kind of stuff either but here's Kratos in a potato suit so enjoy. The addition of trophies is kinda nice and if you're really into earning them this might be a big deal to you. It'll definitely add to the length of each game if you're going for 100%. Probably the greatest thing about this pack is that you get to use the PS3 controller to play this game. Don't get me wrong because I love my handhelds but playing this game on the PSP leads to cramped fingers in a very short time. For example, on the PSP to do the evade move you have to hold in the two shoulder buttons and push the analog stick in the direction you wish to evade. With the PS3 controller it's mapped to the right analog stick which makes this move a bazillion times easier. Overall this is a really nice package for God of War fans. If you haven't played these two great titles then this is a disc that you should have so go get it. Resident Evil 4 was originally released on the GameCube. Sorry, sorry, 4 Resident Evil. That's the second most stupid logo design I swear, right after Resident Evil 6. That's the one where it looks like a giraffe is getting sucked off. Anyway, the GameCube version is the one we're looking at right here. It's when the series took a more action oriented turn and quite honestly started gaining massively in popularity. And for good reason, this game is really, really good. Excuse my gameplay though as it's been forever since I've played it and I'm kinda rusty. But back when this game came out it was a huge deal. The gameplay still holds up for sure. You're Leon Kennedy from Resident Evil 2 and you've been sent to a remote part of Europe to rescue the president's floozy daughter. You encounter what you expect to be zombies but they're not. The people are all still alive they're just crazed and incredibly murderous. What the hell is going on here? This game has been re-released on many different platforms, most usually adding proper widescreen support. The GameCube version here is letterboxed. That means it has less vertical resolution than an anamorphic widescreen game would have. Besides that, I feel like this game was made for the GameCube controller. I mean it really couldn't be more perfect. The game is spread over two discs and I was enthralled from beginning to the very end. Resident Evil 4 was released not too tremendously long ago for the PS4 and Xbox One. And I'm playing the Xbox One version here. Now nothing about the game's title indicates that it's an HD remaster or anything like that but obviously it is. The graphics now look a hell of a lot better. For one it's running at 1080p and of course it's also in full resolution widescreen. As a result everything is much more defined and easier to make out visually. The textures have been improved as well, somewhat. The GameCube version ran at 30 frames per second but here it's been doubled up to 60. So all in all it looks fantastic though not as good as a game that was built from the ground up for this generation. The game also offers some motion blur that you can turn on if you want. I didn't find this effect very pleasing at all and I turned it off quick. In fact I think it made me kind of motion sick. As for the audio, I am disappointed. 
The console puts out 7.1 surround sound audio, but this game is only in stereo, meaning that literally only the left and the right speakers will ever make any sound. I was hoping that they'd give the audio a really nice surround sound treatment as the game really deserves one. The best you can do is turn off surround sound on your console and force stereo. That way your receiver can treat it like Dolby Pro Logic 2 like the GameCube version. It's not truly discrete surround, but it is better than straight stereo. Gameplay wise, well, it's still Resident Evil 4. It was difficult to adapt to playing on the Xbox controller when I'm so used to playing it on the GameCube. It offers multiple types of control and thankfully I found one that pretty much fit my style. Still, you can certainly tell that this game was originally designed for the GameCube. And it certainly doesn't help when the much beloved QuickTime events pop up. I'm like, where the hell is that button on the Xbox controller? I'm gonna die! Every controller has just gotta put their X button in a different place. Still, all in all, I feel that the improvements are well worth it, especially since it runs between $15 and $20 brand new. It's even better if you've never played Resident Evil before. That way you'd never miss the GameCube controller and you could adapt more quickly. It really is a great game to play through and everyone should have it. A lot of people didn't like where this game started to steer the series towards, but I'm glad Capcom did what they did. Fans of the forced camera angles are usually the most ardent detractors of this one, but I think being able to control the camera is great. It does require you to be a lot more precise with your aim though, but it's not that hard. Definitely check this one out. Okay, we're at the breaking point of our episode, and I'm still a little skeptical if these are uh, just cash-in things or not. What about you? I'd say I'm about 50% of the way through forming my opinion. Okay, well, we've got 50% of the show left, so let's try to get a 100% opinion at the end, all right? Let's do this. The Prince of Persia trilogy was released on the PS3 in 2011 in the US. As you'd guessed, it includes The Sands of Time, The Warrior Within, and The Two Thrones all remastered in HD. I'm a fan of the original games and I own all of them on the GameCube. They all run in 480p and in 4x3. So each game does have a story and there's cutscenes all throughout each title and being a trilogy they're all linked together but I was never really interested in the story in the first place. For me it's all about the gameplay. Each game is loaded with action and platforming and I really never got tired of it even though it's very similar throughout the three titles. I recently decided to pick up this disc mainly for review in this episode but also to see how the games turned out in HD. So let's take a look and see. Of course you're going to notice the graphics first. They're now presented in 720p and widescreen. The games do look good in HD and they don't feel as dark as the original releases. It's always nice to be able to make out what you're seeing when you're playing a game. Some of the textures have been worked on and I've noticed differences here and there. As I'm playing the HD versions, I see some screen tearing here and there, and I also notice some stuttering in the video and audio in certain spots. Oh, glory, I would bring my father by, by, by fighting like a warrior in my first. As far as cutscenes go, they seem to be squashed in the HD versions. Characters seem shorter and fatter than they do in the originals. For whatever reason, they just stretch the old 4x3 cutscenes to fill the screen instead of redoing them to actually make them wider. So far, this doesn't seem to be going well, does it? Let's move on to the audio and see what's happening there. Well, I hate to say it, there's not much good news here either. The audio is louder than the originals, and I don't mind that since I can just turn down the volume a bit. But there's other things that I don't have any control over that I wish I did. Firstly, the sound effects in all the games are either too quiet or way too loud. And they all sound like they've been recorded in a tin can. There's just way too much reverb in a lot of cases. <laughs> Lastly, I've got to mention that my PS3 froze on me three separate times when trying to load these games. The problem is definitely not my system, as it works just fine on every other disc that it boots. As far as extras go, you have the option of playing in 3D if you have a TV capable of this feature. Of course, there's the mandatory trophy support that all PS3 games are required to have. And this doesn't bother me, as it's fun to see how many trophies you can rack up in one playthrough. Other than that, there's really nothing special for this release. You get the three games and that's it. That's alright, because as you know, in the end, the extras really don't add a lot to the overall package. Well, this release is definitely flawed, but it's not to the point where I'd say don't buy it. It's just a shame that Ubisoft didn't put more effort into this release. The game is cheap and it's about $19 new, and I do think it's at least worth that price.
Silent Hill 2 Restless Dreams was a favorite of mine on the Xbox. It showed up on the PlayStation 2 first, but I got this version instead. Basically, you're James and you got a letter from your dead wife saying to come visit her in this creepy ass town. Now you're running around looking for her and things are all sorts of jacked up. You have a radio which emits static when you're close to a monster. This is good because you can't usually see them very well with all this fog. The game mainly consists of exploring, fighting, and some puzzle solving. Anyway, the Xbox version runs in progressive scan if you have the component cables, whereas the PS2 version does not. It also has a weird 4.0 type of surround sound. That means sound only comes from the left, right, left surround, and right surround speakers. No center channel, no subwoofer. It's kind of odd, especially given that most Xbox games are in 5.1. All in all, this is a great game once you get the hang of it. Two years later, Silent Hill 3 came out on the PlayStation 2 and also on the PC. I haven't played this one much, but you're Heather and you awaken in some sort of amusement park of death. Lakeside Amusement Park. In fact, we have a lakeside amusement park here in Denver and I cannot wait until it becomes abandoned and haunted. That's gonna kick ass. I mean, the place is already over 105 years old or something like that. Anyway, you defeat some scary monsters and eventually even fall off some roller coaster tracks. But it was all a dream. Or was it? Now some guy's following you, and that's probably even more creepy than Silent Hill itself. Turns out you're on a quest to defeat the vile and evil Claudia. The graphics in this game are just as good, if not better, than Part 2, despite not having a progressive scan mode. The sound design is also much better and has a lot more impact. Enter the Silent Hill HD collection for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. This is the PS3 version. The collection contains both Silent Hill 2 and 3. Now personally, I would have preferred it if it was Silent Hill 1 and 2 instead, or better yet, Silent Hill 1, 2, and 3. I mean, I really liked part one. As you can see, it's a lot cleaner, though it's really hard to tell in the side-by-side -side comparison. The default brightness of the HD remasters is brighter than even the brightest settings on the originals, but you can darken it if you like. Everything is now in 720p. It's also now in widescreen, and that includes all of the menus, maps, and whatnot as well. There's actually quite a bit more to see depending on the scene. No crapping going on here. It usually runs at 30 frames per second, just like the originals. However, it does drop some frames from time to time, especially when you're running. Sometimes it bumps it up to 60 frames per second, though, so the frame rate certainly isn't locked to anything, which is kind of annoying. I'll take a solid frame rate over a fluctuating one any day. Regardless, I feel that the visuals are a nice step up. The audio has also been improved. It's now in 7.1 surround sound on the PS3 and 5.1 surround on the Xbox 360 since that system can't do 7.1. The surround isn't overly aggressive, but every channel does get used, including the subwoofer. This is nice and the cutscenes sound really good. Sometimes you'll hear the monsters running around behind you and you turn around and there they are. I'm really glad that they took the time to do this. The HD remaster was done by a developer called Hijinx. Anyway, apparently Konami lost the source code to the games in a mad rush to delete all the porn off of their hard drives before the supervisor walked into the room. So Hijinx had to work with incomplete versions of the games to make this collection, filling in the gaps along the way. And they did a pretty damn good job considering. From what I can tell of playing the HD version so far, it's very close with very little to no changes in the gameplay. I did notice, however, in the PS2 version, she falls off the roller coaster tracks, but in the HD version, it doesn't. It doesn't show that. However, again, you can't exit out to the main menu from inside the game. You'll need to quit back to the PS3 menu and restart the game. I love it when compilations do that. Who doesn't? Also, Silent Hill 3's pause button and inventory button are backwards from Silent Hill 2's. So the select and start buttons do the opposite thing depending on which game you're playing. Silent Hill 2 offers an option to play with newly recorded voices or with the original voices. I guess maybe people complained about the originals? And here's what both versions sound like. Maybe. And it's not just the fog either. Okay, it's... I got it. I'll be careful. I'm not lying. No, I believe you. Maybe. And it's not just the fog either. It's... Okay, I got it. I'll be careful. I'm not lying. No, I, I believe you. And all of Silent Hill 3's dialogue has been re-recorded as the originals were lost in the mad data dump at Konami. So you don't get any option for original voices here. Anyway, I'm coming home now. Oh, I didn't get that thing you asked me to. It's still a great collection though, even if part one isn't included and there are some weird odds and ends. 
It's holding its value pretty well, so it's not cheap, but it's not currently that expensive either. Personally, I felt it was worth the price when I bought it, and I still do. The Eco and Shadow of Colossus collection was released in 2011 for the PS3. Bluepoint Games handled the remaster of these two titles, so let's see how they did. When Eco was originally released in 2001, it was in 240p, and that's pretty weird given that most of the games on the console are interlaced at 480i. The only thing special was the awesome gameplay itself. You play as a young boy who is locked away because he has horns. After he breaks free, he meets a girl and the two of them must find their way out of probably the biggest castle that there ever was. The platforming and puzzles were mesmerizing and I never once got tired of dragging that girl all over the place. As far as the HD remake goes, it really makes the game stand out. The game is now in widescreen at 1080p and it looks amazing. That's about five times the visual information than the original. The castle has never looked so big since you can see a lot more of it as you're making your way around. The PS2 version was much more blurry when you're looking in the distance, so it's nice to have some detail in the background now. If you're used to playing the US version, then you're going to notice some changes because the remaster was based off the European release. The game almost felt kind of new to me since some of the puzzles are different. Switches are placed in different spots, and save points are also not where I was used to them in the PS2 version. The sound also was remastered and is now in 7.1 surround, and this goes for both games. So let's move on to Shadow of Colossus. A spiritual sequel to Eco, this game is all about killing the enormous colossi in hopes of bringing your loved one back from death. When this title was originally released in 2005, Sony really pushed the PS2 and it was displayed in 480p and widescreen. Even today as I play this game it looks really good, well that is until I pop in the HD remaster. Right off the bat in the options menu is a full pixel mode option. This allows the game to take advantage of the full 16x9 of today's TVs and not the limited real estate of the old CRT TVs with their massive overscan. I'm blown away by how good this game looks and it really does look like it could be a PS3 title in its own right. The 1080p makeover simply looks amazing and I really enjoy every minute of playing through this game again. The original game suffered from some slowdown when you're climbing and trying to kill the colossi. Not here though, everything moves nice and smooth at a constant 30 frames per second. Everything looks really smooth. Like here, this huge bridge in the PS2 version is all jaggy lines, but in the HD version it looks like it should all the way back to the mountain in the background. So the games look amazing and the HD remake has made them feel fresh again, but let's take a look at what else is offered on this disc. The games are playable in 3D, so that's cool, and if you've played them in 3D, tell me how it looks. The game's cover is also reversible to show the original artwork. This is really cool and it didn't take me long to change mine to this. There's lots of interviews with the developer and his team including videos that show prototypes and concept art. There's even dynamic themes for your PS3 for both games. The Eco one is okay, but I really do like the Shadow of Colossus one. In the end, this is exactly how a remaster should always be. There's so much included here that it just feels like the developer really cares about the final product and not just porting the games over and hoping that people will buy them. But this is one that everyone should buy, so go get it and let me know what you think. Alright, those are some HD remasters, certainly not all, there's actually quite a bit more out there and yeah. honestly Dave, I'm, I'm kind of interested in a lot of them. They don't always you know, work out really well, but no. some, when they do, it's, it's really nice. It really is amazing and on my part, the Sony stuff really came out amazing. Well, you only played Sony well, stuff. Well, <laughs> Ubisoft, I had uh, Ubisoft or whatever, Prince Ubisoft, of Persia, yeah. <laughs> and that was so-so. I, I like yeah. the High Definition remake, but you know, it had problems. Indeed. And, you know, sometimes, you know, like you said, they, they don't really do as much as they could. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they, they do come through and actually make it worth your money. Right. So what do you guys think? What are some of your favorite HD remasters? Have you ever tried any? Let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag.
man, I don't want to clean up all these leaves. I just want to play Green Dog on a 16-bit Sega Genesis. Man. Joe. Oh, what hey, are you Dave. Doing? Hey, man. Hey, you want to clean up all these leaves? I'll let you play Green Dog. You will? Yeah. yeah I'll do it. Okay. Ah, this sucks. I want to play Green Dog. All right, Joe, I'm done. Thanks. All right. Well, this is the quality I expect from Sega. I'd rather rake leaves and play this crap. Leave it to Sega to make cleaning leaves feel like fun. 